Ukrainian veteran of the Second World War. Who fought the Ukrainian independence against the Russians and continues to support the troops today, even at his age of 98. Invited by House Speaker Anthony Rota to witness Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's address to Parliament, Yaroslav Hunka is one of his constituents. He's a Ukrainian hero, a Canadian hero, and we thank him for all his service. That was the jubilant scene Friday. Now new details have emerged about that war service MPs applauded. Hunka served in the 1st Galician Division, a voluntary unit commanded by the Nazis. The unit is complicit in the Holocaust. They this Jewish human rights campaigner says there's no defending former soldiers like Hunka. You swore allegiance to Hitler and you were involved with the massacre of civilians. So it doesn't matter if you uh, try and claim that you were defending against communism, you were still involved with the Nazi war machine. With the eyes of the world upon all of you, all of us, as President of the United States, I understand the duty my country has to lead in this critical moment. And I am aware of the attempts to make some shady dealings behind the scenes. Just, I mean, you remind me of our better selves in America. That there was a time in America that we were this way. Fighting to the last person, we're going to be free or die. Free or die. Free or die. Now you are free. Yes. And we will be. And the Russians are dying. Гнилость американской политической системы, которая не может претендовать на то, чтобы учить других демократии. I think the Chinese are setting up the new global world order that's going to rest on China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, whatever they can pick up in the BRICS and the global south, and then they'll reset the rules of the international rules-based order to to really favor themselves economically on trade and and military possessions and on influence in global regions yeah uh, what do you make of 100 chinese nationals trying to get into u.s military bases appearing as tourists and saying hey all have the same story what is with that <laughs> yeah, it's like they're coming in through the doors and the walls and the crack in the floor. Yeah, the Chinese are, are clearly penetrating United States intelligence. The 21st century will not belong to China. It should and will belong to the United States. Canada and Ukraine have agreed to engage with G7 partners to establish a working group of eminent persons who will provide advice on the seizure and forfeiture of Russian assets, including of the Russian Central Bank. Second, second, we're adding another 63 Russian individuals and entities to our sanctions list, including those complicit in the kidnapping of children and the spreading of disinformation. Our industries and tech companies like competition. They know that global competition is good for business and that it creates and protects jobs here in Europe. But competition is only true as long as it is fair. Too often our companies are excluded from foreign markets or are victims of predatory practices. They are often undercut by competitors benefiting from huge state subsidies. We have not forgotten how China's unfair trade practices affected our solar industry. I rise to put the leadership of the House, the Senate, and the President of the United States on notice. I will not consent to any expedited passage of any spending bill that provides any more American aid to Ukraine. It's as if no one has noticed that we have no extra money to send to Ukraine. Our deficit this year will exceed $1.5 trillion. Borrowing money from China to send it to Ukraine makes no sense. It's not as if we have some sort of rainy day fund sitting around trillions of dollars at a pot of money and we're just going to send that to Ukraine. We're going to borrow it. When we borrow it and create new money to pay for that borrowing, we create the inflation that is plaguing our economy. Since the beginning of Russia's war in Ukraine, the American taxpayers provided Ukraine with $113 billion. Over the 583 days of war, 
between February 24th, 2022 and the end of the month, that averages $6.8 billion per month or $223 million per day. Hey, everybody. It's Alex with Reportify Media, and I'm joined here with Daniel Dumbrell and, of course, Brian Berletic and Angelo Giuliano. Is that correct? Did I get that right today? I think I did. It's a, it's a great surprise. Great surprise to have a last-minute guest, uh, Daniel. It's, uh, it's great to have you. 30 minutes ago, he told me that you guys were going to be talking a little bit about Canada. So I jumped on my motorcycle <laughs> and uh, I zoomed in here. And uh, I'll, I, I might only be here for 20 or 30 minutes, but I'm happy to join you guys. It's been a really long time. Oh, welcome, everybody. Uh, time check here is 9.09 in China on the 27th of September. And wow, what a news day. Another day for Justin Trudeau and another headline, a shocking headline. Someone lost their job, I think, yesterday or resigned because of it. Uh, over to you, my friend. Yeah, no, I mean, that was quite an interesting uh, event uh, where the entire parliament stood up to cheer on a literal Nazi. Uh, originally, people were saying he was Nazi associated. No, he's a literal Nazi. Um, it, it's just an, it, there's so many dynamics to this situation that make it so interesting. I mean, this guy himself, the fact that he went into parliament knowing that this would happen, that he was going to be celebrated, means that this is still not a good guy. I mean, if he knew what he did and he kind of came to terms with uh, the evils of his past, he would have said, you know what, guys, this actually isn't something that should be celebrated. The other thing that probably is even more remarkable is that everybody in Parliament stood up after they said it was, you know, a Ukrainian fighting against the Russians in World War II. There was not a single person you could see that sat down that said, hold on a second, I'm not going to stand up for this. And it just shows how intellectually and historically deficient uh, Canadian Parliament is. And it plays into a lot of the other issues that go on in terms of how they uh, counter China and all of these other kinds of uh, geopolitical issues. Uh, I mean, it's it's to no surprise. I mean, I've been talking about the Baltic states for a while. They have a lot of lot of dark things going on in those states here. And these are three states that just sit on the border of, uh, you know, well, they're former Soviet countries. And, you know, this also adds to the history of Canada here. We have got a lot of dark clouds in Canada with the uh, recent graves that were found in the churches. Uh, I mean, this is a history that uh, is now finally coming to the surface. And I think it also puts people on alert now to, you know, if you're going to run for office, if you're going to sit in the parliament, for God's sakes, get educated. Because this is an absolute embarrassment for everybody uh, in their ridings right now. They've got to go back. They've got to explain this to their constituents. Uh, well, really didn't know what was going on, uh, you know. And once again, I mean, every November we have a Remembrance Day. I mean, you are reminded every year about World War II and World War I in Canada. And uh, this happens. This, uh, this, is, this has to go down as probably one of the, ma the biggest gaffes I've ever seen in Canadian history. Yeah, I mean, it, it really is totally inexcusable. I mean, the fact that Zelensky there is from Ukraine, he's the president of Ukraine, uh, he even more so than anybody else in that room, mm -hmm. when he heard those words, mm -hmm. what this guy did during what period Gosh. of time, and especially as somebody who is Jewish, he mm -hmm. should have said, hold on a second. <laughs> let's let's put the brakes on this um and he didn't i mean how i, I don't know what you guys think i mean uh, uh, uh brian and and you know and, and anybody else here what do you think of um you know whether they were really aware of this or not i, I just find it really difficult to believe that nobody could have uh, been aware of this it's it's ignorance it's also like brian and i had a guy on a show about four or five months ago that just totally german won like he, he, a German guy, I mean, fire away, Brian. This guy was, he, I could not believe he managed to stick around uh, as long as he did on the show. I mean, he eventually wussed out and left the program because he was getting nailed so hard. But you could see it. It was deep into his roots and his bloods, the anger. This just shows you yesterday how much hatred there is for Russians. That's the first one. And then secondly, to, to see the parliament embrace this guy it didn't matter what was said in there. Everybody would have went up and started clapping. And, I mean, you couldn't have asked uh, for a more sobering moment for Justin Trudeau to hopefully, finally get, uh, you know, kicked out of this uh, country. And, uh, I mean, over to you, Brian. Yeah. Well, you I want to go back to 
I want to go back to something <laughs> Daniel said about how this literal Nazi who ha actually hailed Hitler while Hitler was still alive. I mean, that that's what we're talking about. He he didn't see what he did, what as, he did. as being wrong. Oh, somebody's um, somebody has it. Uh, Angela, you got uh, a window open or something? We're good. No, no. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, so it, you know, he he did that. He didn't see anything wrong with that. Uh, people in modern day Ukraine who are Nazis, modern day Nazis, they don't see anything wrong with this. The continuation of all of this to modern to modern times, there's nothing wrong with it in their minds. And then double so because the West has been supporting this ever since the end of World War II. There were there were uh, someone in the comment section mentioned Operation Paperclip, where the U.S. actually brought high-ranking Nazis into the United States to take senior positions within government, U.S. government agencies. There was uh, Operation Gladio, a stay-behind networks that were created in case the Soviet Union invaded uh, uh, what, Europe, and they were primarily made up of former Nazis and people sympathetic to Nazism. And, and so this is something that the West built up over decades and decades. And the people involved in all of this, including actual Nazis who just kind of were brought over from, from the end of the war and then into the Cold War, they don't see anything wrong with what they did. They, they see themselves as, well, now we're on the side of, of America and the rest of the West against these horrible Russians and uh, just, just as you said, they hate Russia so much that they can't even imagine a time in history where they were allies uh, fighting in a war like World War II against actual Nazis, like the, the worst people ever in, in modern history, uh, the Nazis. So I don't know. A a Angela, if you want to build on that or take it in some other direction. Uh, I, think, I think the big question is why did they bring him? And uh, I think it's, it's, also to, to put, it's important to put this in the context. Uh, we are in a context of a normalization of Nazis. I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, what we had, uh, there was a vote at the UN, and it was against the glorification of Nazis. And that vote, the first vote, I think it was in 2021, and uh, only two countries were against. So there was the US and Ukraine. Now, the last vote was 52 countries, most of them from the collective West. So you see, we've been whitewashing also as of before 2019, you had lots of articles denouncing this Nazi ideology. After that, nothing. They were the new cool. So you see, what worries me is that this is the new normal. And we it is also in, in, within the context where we are rewriting history. You see, with the Hiro Hiroshima, they almost blame Russia on the bombing. They don't even mention the U.S., the European Union. So this is a whole context of whitewashing and actually rewriting history. And maybe I have the impression that what they did, that's my personal, uh, personal opinion, they are testing how far they can go and what would be the public opinion. But again, I think this is the new normal. It is, it is becoming the new normal because, because Ukraine won't change if war ends up there will be this Nazi problem which still exist, and somehow you need to do something about it. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's it, it, this whole situation that unfolded actually allows you to comprehend why some people cannot even get to the point of a discussion where you can say, all right, what is the West's role in provoking this conflict? They don't even want to go there. It's like it's a complete blank space that they cannot comprehend. And it is driven by a hatred and propaganda against Russia. It's dri driven by such hatred towards Russia. And if the hatred towards Russia is so extreme that they could invite by mistake, potentially, by not, maybe not by mistake, but invite a Nazi into parliament to celebrate him, if that's how deep their hatred goes, you start to understand why it's helpless to even try to start explaining to them the nuances behind this conflict. They're just too far gone. Now, on the bright side though, I mean, this situation could be a moment of awakening for a lot of people who say, whoa, hold on a second. All right. You know, because if, if I mean, if people really thought that Russia was interfering as much as they say, if Russia could design a PSYOP 
to kind of, you know, affect the entire world's perspective on this thing. The perfect thing for them to do would be to infiltrate Canadian Parliament to allow them to accidentally invite a Ukrainian Nazi in to celebrate him and get him in there. But the thing is, Russia didn't do this. This is all on their own, despite Justin Trudeau in his responses trying to say, oh, we still have to be aware about Russian propaganda. No, don't even mention Russia. This is on you. But if they were to organize a PSYOP, they couldn't have even imagined anything as good as this, anything as good as what Canada did to themselves. I think a lot of this also plays on the education that we got in Canada growing up. We were pretty much told, you know, anything... Uh, you know, east of Berlin was no man's land. Stay away from it. Toxic. It's going to ruin your life. Even the words, uh, you know, socialism, communism that rolled around, they were such heavy, heavy, toxic words that it was ingrained into our brain. And uh, I remember telling the story on this program uh, before the Internet came out. Uh, I was 26 years old when the Internet first came out. And I was always had a lot of questions, you know, what happened, what was going on in World War II, I wanted to research, uh, I lost my grandfather in World War II, say that even though I wasn't born yet, and he'd already died, but anyway, um, just remembering it from Remembrance saying I remember going to the libraries in Canada and saying, I'd like some books, I want to study history, uh, and they said, well, what part? Okay, let's go to the 40s and 50s. Well, we got these books that will cover, you know, Canada's contribution, United States contribution, I said, I want to hear the other side. I said, well, it's uh, not in the curriculum. I said, the Dewey Decimal System as we got in Canada. I said, are you sure? Can we dig deeper into these library books? No, no, no. Internet comes out, 95, 96, somewhere around that point. Start digging, start getting some answers, and then started to see some library books starting to show up in the school system talking about this uh, other side of the war. And I think it's a lot of, you, you can look at the parliament in Canada. M most of the people are probably younger than you and I sitting in some of those ridings and some of those, uh, uh, you know, places and provinces, what they represent. But it's clear ignorance is, first of all, anybody with half a brain that would have known uh, as soon as you mentioned those uh, situations in a speech, especially from the House Speaker, somebody should immediately, if... They were educated, I'm saying, and put up their hand or done something or been brave enough to walk out. You can walk out of that place. You can walk out as, as, as a member of parliament. You just put your hands up. Say, I, I've got nothing to do with this. And I tell you, probably if one or two of those people walked out, they, they might have been the future uh, prime minister of this country because this is very embarrassing. And I, I bet you Trudeau didn't even realize it until it was all over, done and dusted. And then he got out there because I watched an interview with him last night. This is the first time I've ever seen that guy totally lost for words. And all he could pivot, as Brian and Angelo and you guys have said all along, all he could pivot to, Russia. And then he says, not only are we going to stop this, but we're going to stop those people that are, you know, disseminating disinformation. Once again, that's the threat to all YouTubers. That's a threat to all content creators or anybody that has a voice. That's a threat. And that's it right there, because he knows that his Canadian Broadcasting Council are going to really downplay this and the CTV and all those networks. But then it's up to us to get this message out. And here we are. Right. Well, I, I just wanted to say whether they knew or they didn't know that it, it's equally as bad. If they didn't know that this guy was a Nazi and they invited him in. Uh, that that is just as bad because if they didn't if they don't understand uh, i'm introducing a guy who fought the russians in world war ii and i don't understand that 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 could only mean that he was a nazi if he, the head of canada's parliament didn't know that what else does he not know about ukraine past and present and if he doesn't know these basic fundamental things how do ordinary C canadians who are paying their tax dollars that are going to Ukraine and weapons going to Ukraine and Ukrainians coming to Canada to train and go back and fight in this proxy war, how do they know that isn't an, an, an equal sum of their ignorance? In other words, do we know that this is a just war that we're involved in supporting? And, and the answer should be no, we don't know that if this is how ignorant the head of parliament is. And if he did do it deliberately, that's obviously that's even, that's even worse. Uh, so, I think no matter which way you cut it, it's extremely bad. I think Canadians need, and obviously Americans and Europeans, they need to all 
start look, take a second look at everything they think they know about Ukraine. And, and for Justin Trudeau to say, oh, this is, uh, you know, don't forget about Russian propaganda. Russia yeah. is saying Ukraine has a Nazi problem. They obviously have a Nazi problem. If ev everywhere you point a camera, every Ukrainian that you try to, to honor and have stand up in parliament is a Nazi, then it, I think they have a Nazi problem. I don't think it's Russian propaganda. And this entire panel knows Patrick Lancaster. He was one of the guys that was, uh, you know, in the Donbass area. He went into the basement and he found a body in the basement. I don't know if you guys know this story, but uh, he filmed the whole video, put it on YouTube. They quickly either deleted it or got part of that segment taken out. And he was screaming to the heavens saying it. And, you know, another thing is uh, about yesterday's gaffe is what, you know, when you wake up in the morning and there's five missed calls from your mom and uh, she's watching it live saying, son, look out. This is going to be a big news day. Well, here it is. And uh, she was just beside she when she was watching this program and watching the House of Commons because they, they stream it live and stuff like that. And when it went on, first she was saying, you know, listen to all these people clapping. And then uh, when they named the guy, she was just an utter shock, utter shock. And I'm just wondering if this is going to be a lesson for Canadians in history is this going to change the narrative of, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau's uh, policy here to try to educate Canadians that, hey, we got to stand with Ukraine. We got to get behind them. I bet you there's not one Canadian that has, you know, a Ukraine flag waving out their house. know or even understand how complex the situation is. And this is going to be it's on every news channel, international. This is going to be what we call dinner table po politics. This is coming to a dinner table in Canada. And I think this just might start to raise some eyebrows in Canada saying, wait a minute, what? We were told this, this country is clean. What did they do? And we didn't have that education, guys, in school. I'm telling you right now, they did not educate us in, in especially elementary and high school in Canada, this kind of things. They didn't. And I, they still don't. So we're left up to the propaganda engines, uh, the collective West, to tell us the stories. Well, I think what I, my uh, sorry, Brian, do you want to go first or? So I just wanted to ask you both the question as Canadians, uh, do, do you I mean, do you know people in Canada that are starting to fall into this trap? And they did the same thing with the, the proxy war in Syria. They were trying to rehabilitate ISIS and Al Qaeda as if they were the good guys again. And now we see them doing the exact same thing with the Nazis. They've been very careful about it. But there's been this, as Alex pointed out, there's this drawn out whitewashing taking place. Do you know Canadians who are like, well, maybe maybe they have a questionable past, but now they're doing the right thing and we should support them because Russia is, is even worse. I mean, are there people actually... Do you think that that'll work? Do you think this rehabilitation I don't, I don't know. for that Nazis? Seems, that seems like a little bit of a stretch, but it, I wouldn't be surprised if they try to massage people into that. I think the thing that they're going to do to try to mitigate uh, the right questions from being uh, asked from this event, like, you know, why were there Nazis living their <laughs> lives freely in Canada to begin with? And how is our government so inept uh, that something like this could even happen in the first place? What I think is going to happen, and you can already see the beginnings of this, is that it's going to be, um, and this is the beauty, uh, if you want to say that, of the Western systems, is it's just going to become a blame game where the conservatives are going to say the liberals are responsible for this. Um, and it's just going to be a back and forth. And, you know, maybe the, you know, Justin Trudeau's government will be voted out uh, because of this. And people will say, well, that's the beauty of our system. They were responsible for this. So we voted them out and we voted a new government in, forgetting that everybody from that new government also stood up and cheered for that exact same guy. Um, maybe they'll go after this guy and say, because I think Poland has now uh, put forward, uh, some MPs have put forward a, a, a proposition to extradite this guy. They, um, they better get ready to extradite a few thousand. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. Is in one guy. But here's the thing. This is the case that is in everybody's face. So if they just do something where people say, all right, that was a bad situation, but we took care of it. You know, we voted in a new government uh, even though they're really not uh, different in any meaningful way. Yeah. And that guy was taken care of, case closed, when it could have been something that said, hold on a second, maybe there is something we need to be asking about this entire situation, about what's going on in Ukraine. Hold on a second, how is it so likely that every time a camera is turned on on the battlefields in Ukraine, they all have Nazi symbols on their uniforms? I think 
uh, I think there are very sophisticated psyop departments that will try to figure out how to get people distracted on um, more inconsequential uh, kind of you know small issues so that they don't get to those important questions. I, I think I think I think that's more likely than trying to completely mm. whitewash Nazis. Mm. But honestly, that wouldn't surprise me <laughs> if, if that did happen. But, but just I'd like to jump in. I think it's really important just to go back to history. Remember, this is not the first time that the, the West, Europe and the US is fa favorable to the Nazis. Just remember before World War II. Before World War II, you had in Madison Square 30,000 pro-Nazis that would have events there. You know, you had Hoover in 1938. He met ex-president of the US. He met with, the, with, the, with Hitler. You had no boycott. They all went, Europeans and the US, they all went to Berlin Olympics. And it's very important. People tend to forget, but who was the real enemy before World War II was Russia, the USSR. And actually, Hitler, you know, this whole Germany was, you know, benefited from a lot of transfer of technology and funding from Wall Street. What they did, they funded Germany at the beginning. And then when Germany was about to win, then they, they did a land lease agreement with Russia and they massively helped Russia. I want to add one more thing is that so they wanted to basically kill them, just fund both sides and kill them. That's not the first time they, they, they do that. But there's a very interesting paper by, uh, you know, like uh, there was a plan called uh, the, the Project Unthinkable by Churchill. In May 1945, he had a plan that once actually uh, Russia, the USSR had almost won, they would against Germany, they would attack, give a final blow to the USSR. So you see, this is not the first time we are favorable to, to Nazis. And what we did is that we actually recycled many Nazis. You know where they ended up? There was paper clip. There was Gladio operation, but also we recycled Nazis, you know where? In the right. EU. The first president of the EU was a Nazi. The first, I think one of the first into NATO to lead NATO was an ex Nazi. So you see, I, I think you see this is not the first time we want we are whitewashing Nazis and, it, and they make it so easy. Uh, so so I, I wouldn't be surprised that this is a trend. It's just testing, and, and we see the direction. You know, we, we see the direction when you have fifty two countries overnight within a period of one year that say Nazis glorification of Nazis is okay. Then you need to worry, and this is you know you shape you shape the narrative, you shape the mind of people. It takes a few Hollywood movies and that's it. Average Joe, he will just jump into it. The new bad guy who eats babies is the Russian. That's pretty accurate, uh, Angelo. I would say so. I mean, you know, these uh, these Hollywood machines are very, very powerful. You know, my father, uh, who also was in the Navy, always said to me, you know, you'll never see a good, good war movie made about the Germans as well. And I mean, if we're going to tell the story and we're going to tell history, I mean, people need to understand how complex it was back in the, the 40s. But if we fast forward it to today, most people, once again, Angelo and Brian, is they have this hatred of Russia. This has been brewing for a long time. This is not just something that's happened the last couple of years. This started back even earlier uh, when I was in the Baltic states you could see that separation happening. And these are three countries that still have 20 to 25% ethnic Russians living in that country or outside post-Soviet people that are living in these countries. I mean, I, I've spoken about this already on this program a couple of times about the alien passport, the alien passport in uh, Estonia. 10% of Estonia's population are stateless. They're told, okay, we want you to take the Estonian passport. No, we don't. Why would I take an Estonian passport if I was born in Russia? Well, you need that to comply. Well, give me dual citizenship. Nope, against the law. Can't do that in uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Totally forbidden. So the right to citizenship is not dual citizenship. It's okay. We want you to comply. All the babushkas, the 60, 70 year old grandmothers that, uh, you know, still want to go visit somebody in Novosibirsk or Yekaterinburg were told, no, give up that passport, learn, forcefully learn the language. And then and only then you'll get the coveted Estonian passport. 
well, goodbye to 10% of that ethnic uh, Russians in that country that are told they're holding out. They're holding out for a reason. And the reason why they're holding out is this exact thing that is happening right now in Ukraine, where Putin is trying to protect these people, trying to you know stop the West from pretty much you know being getting rid of these people. It's very clear. And you can see it in modern day that these Estonians... I'll call them gray passport. It's humiliating. To, can you imagine that? The European Union is accepting giving 10% of Estonians' population a gray, and they call it alien passport. In 2023, how humiliating is that to people? And that passport does not allow them. It allows them a little bit of travel uh, you know, flexibility in uh, the country, uh, of Euro- uh, as well other countries in Europe. But it doesn't allow them to work necessarily in other EU countries. That's the other one. And if you're going to give up that passport, think about it for a minute here. That's your attachment to Russia. Well, guess what? If you're a Russian and you want to come into Europe right now, good luck getting a visa. So there it is there. With one uh, final swoosh, they're trying to get rid of this entire population in the Baltics. And I'm telling you guys... The same thing is going to happen up in that area. You know, my wife, she speaks Russian. Her friends speak Russian. They got Russian friends down there. They've been very good, very calm during this situation. But I'm telling you, this could boil over very easy. Yeah, it's really remarkable, too, when you talk about, um, you know, because some of this stuff like language assimilation and things like that, uh, a lot of people might think, well, okay, whatever. Why should I really care about this? But the thing is, is this the is this is the exact thing that they convince people to care about when they try to say it's happening in China. When yeah. they actually inaccurately say that these, you know, Tibetan cultures or all these things are being totally assimilated into Mandarin and they're not allowed to speak their language, which, which is totally false. But regardless, even if they believe that's true, they care when they hear something like that is happening in China. But as soon as it's happening to Russians somewhere, no big deal. So it's like, do you care about this stuff or do you not care about this stuff? And you can just see all the things here. Uh, unlike Estonian citizen holders of Estonian alien passports, do not enjoy freedom of movement within the EU and Schengen. So what, are we caging these people now? Is this modern day? You know, This is exactly what the Western media is attacking China, as you're saying, Brian, or uh, Daniel. And <laughs> again here, this is one of the comments from uh, one of the Latvian leaders. Uh, he says, I do not approve of automatically granting Estonian citizens to people with undetermined citizenship, basically Russians. Let's be honest what you're saying here. And then the the last slide that I have on this whole this whole matter is, you know, just going into details of of how crazy this is. But this is what's got, I think, everybody into the hot water. And and it it reaches a boiling point where people wonder, you know, why did Vladimir Putin go and, you know, protect this Donbass area? Why was he there? It's exactly what he's saying. They are trying to cleanse this country of the, you know, these, these Nazi sympathizers that are fighting for the military. It's blatantly obvious. And you can see that it's, it's going to continue all the way up to the Baltics unless something's done. And it, there should be no surprise that if there is more of this stuff going on, I, I, give, here's the last example I want to give you. There's 22% Russian-speaking people in Latvia, about 18% in Lithuania, and I think a little bit more in Estonia. Imagine if the EU started to, mm, let's say, okay, wait a minute, we're going to try to convert you guys to EU passports, whether you like it or not. No more bringing the family over or anything like that. Push these people into the corner. If they take a vote and say, wait a minute, we're going to. And, and there are pockets in Estonia, too, that are very, um, you know, Russian speaking uh, near the border of Russia. There is a population of about 40, 45,000. They could easily say, OK, we want to take this province or this district here in Estonia. We want independence. And bingo, you've got a Ukraine 3.0 sitting in your doorsteps and Russia will come in there. And once again. You know, it's 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 very very complicated, and this mess has never uh, been figured out. And well, it's it's all it's reached all the way down to the floors of parliament, and people still don't get it. I, I probably um, have a little bit of a different opinion on one aspect of that, which is I think the Nazi issue is obviously very easy to prove. It's mm-hmm. a legitimate issue. Um, personally, I think, and I don't necessarily have specific evidence for this, but my feeling is that. 
I, I don't think the real reason Russia is going in is to fix a far right Nazi issue in these countries. I, I think it, it very obviously when NATO was approaching and NATO has already admitted to being in Ukraine long before this started. And you have this organization that claims to be defensive, but has already proven it is not a defensive organization. They completely destroyed Libya um, and it was not for defensive purposes. And you have this organization that is head by a, uh, headed by a warmongering power that is known to destroy countries, to overthrow governments, to assassinate their leaders, approaching your borders. And you're continually saying, stop approaching our borders. And even Biden himself a couple of decades ago said, if we do this, it's going to provoke a reaction. I think for me, that seems like the obvious core reason. I think if they talk about Nazis and they talk about this issue, it is actually legitimate and it is perhaps something that is easier to empathize with. So, you know, everybody does propaganda. I think from a propaganda point of view, they can say, guys, there's Nazis that need to be taken care of here. Mm. And for some people, they might say, that's something I can empathize with. But it gets a little bit too deep and a little bit too complex. If you say, listen, NATO is not really a defensive organization. Here's all the things they can do. This is what it means for us if they approach our borders. I, that, that's my just my own. That's thought. an interesting perspective. Yeah. Brian, or I keep calling you Brian. Keep It's Daniel. <laughs> I'm not used to this guy being here. OK, but you're looking at the clock from 2022. I'm looking at the clock on 2013, 2014, when the shelling of Ukrainian citizens living in the Ukraine by the Ukraine army were blowing these people up, blowing a half a billion dollar airport out of uh, Donetsk, shutting off the electricity, shutting off the water, shutting off the pension, shutting off the banking system, shutting off Western Union, pretty much collapsing that type of, and that side of the country. There was no, no talk of NATO back in 2014. Briefly, there was. But something and some organizations decided to shell these people and mercilessly shell them. And then Russia finally says, OK, guys, you know what? We're going to arm this. Maybe this we're going to arm. We're going to come in. We're going to offer a little bit of support. Brian knows this story a hell of a lot more than I do in detail. But from watching Patrick Lancaster spend 10 years in that country and getting him in the Donbass area, Thank God we have him in there uh, videotaping, I would say, once again, uh, some serious uh, indexing of videos for tribunals to watch in, in the future. Something was going on there for from the 2013-2014. That movement that was starting in Kiev with those militaries, that, to my understanding, uh, Daniel, I agree with you that there's much more to this than, uh, you know, the NA, NAZIs. Uh, and yes, I agree with you that there is a NATO element, but something in 2014 managed to rally the troops of their own country to shell their own country. And that's still going on today. Brian. Well, well yeah, let me, or, ask Brian, let me ask Brian then, because uh, I know you cover this a lot. What is your perspective on the idea that they perhaps might be boosting that element of it, which, yes, there were human rights abuses, there were atrocities that in Ukraine that were being committed. Yes, there was a Nazi problem, but perhaps that they are boosting that more uh, than it actually matters compared to the NATO element. Where do you stand on that? What do you, what do you think of that uh, concept or idea? I, I, think I, I think I do agree with you, Daniel. I, I, I think, and Alex is making good points also, it is primarily the U.S. trying to encircle and contain Russia and then uh, infiltrate, divide, and destroy the Russian Federation. That is Russia's primary concern. The U.S. is also using not Nazi extremists, modern-day Nazis, to do this. They're also shelling cities with Russian-speaking people that, that Russia considers uh, their people. So, you know, you add all of those things up. This is what's driving them to get involved. As you say, Daniel, it's much easier to convince Russian people that this needs to be done. It, you know, even if it was just the U.S. doing this to encircle and contain Russia, and there were no Nazis, it would still be absolutely essential for Russia to react. Uh, but because the U.S. is using Nazis, it just makes it so much easier to convince people that this needs this needs to be taken care of. Russia needs to invest in this because it is, it's a matter of national security and it's tied directly to national security concerns that Russia, the Soviet Union had during World War II. It's, the, it's a continuation, really. 
when you study World War II very deeply, it's, it's a continuation of everything that was going on there. And at the very end of the war, the U.S. was trying to assert itself as uh, the, the sole global hegemon. It was trying to get rid of the Soviet Union. It was trying to contain China. It was trying to reassert Western control over all of Europe's colonies. That was what the Vietnam War was all about. And so that, that was the primary force driving geopolitics from the end of World War II up to and including today. The U.S. trying to encircle and contain and eliminate near peer and peer competitors. And then there, there's all these things that they're doing involved in that that are so repugnant that it just makes it so easy for, say, Russia or China to tell their their people, look, look what they're doing and look how they're doing it. So it's, you know, it's a very it's a very easy case for Beijing and Moscow to make. And it doesn't mean that they're cynically taking advantage of this. But I, I think I agree with Daniel. The, the number one concern of Russia is self-preservation. And that is NATO sure. and the U.S. Sure. represents a, a direct threat to that. They've all but said that, that they want to absorb Russia. I mean, that, that is what they actually say at, say, the Atlantic Council. And, and Angelo, your thoughts on kind of not Nazism versus self-preservation, a mix oh. of both, or, you know, like, yeah. No, no, I, I think, uh, like, like Brian just said, I think it's a, it's a matter of national security. Uh, the, the, the Nazi uh, thing, it, it's bothering, the, of course, it's bothering Russian, but it's more like a internal communication. They, they, Putin can sell much easier by putting this, but that, that is not the, the main reason. I think it's more like national security. And the Russians, they, were, they, they knew exactly what, what the collective West wanted to do. I mean, basically, it was regime change. This, uh, this uh, 2019 RAND Corporation paper that says clearly what they want to do about re Russia. And, and it's interesting, you know, more, the more we, 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 go, we go ahead, uh, you know, with this special military operation, we see those behavior you know, whitewashing uh, Nazis and so on. You see, there's so many similarities. It's a continuation of World War II. Hitler went into the USSR. One of the main reasons was because to wage war, Hitler had no, more, had no access to oil. He needed oil and he had to get oil from the USSR. Now, and he called that the Lebensraum, you know, because they wanted to expand. It's no different. Now they actually open about this, they, say, they, they see Russia as being the country with the, 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 the largest natural resources, $75 trillion. It's a huge country and they want to put their, they put their hands on this. We know when they say, uh, actually, you know, we need to be very careful. Uh, we, we, we keep to simplify uh, saying countries. In reality, we, are, we need to remind people, this is, those are globalist elites. We are talking about big families, uh, multinational corporation, they are actually the one doing the game, uh, but they are they are hiding behind countries, uh, because ultimately what they want to do this globalist project is about uh, destruction of nation state and make make you know a whole world compact, and you have above you know the those globalist elites you know make a huge market slave labor control. And that, that, that's the plan. But it's, it's really important just to go back, back and forth. Keep, keep reminding people that this globalist agenda is not about countries. You know, and, uh, and, and, and even when you look at the president, every single president has been pre-selected by those globalist elites through the World Economic Forum, Bilderberg Group, George Soros, and so on. They're just puppets. And, 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 and the first victims are are actually the citizen of those countries. <laughs> why, why, why there's such a distrust of their leaders, of, of their democracy in the collective West? It's because they, they are the first victims of, of that system. The, the puppets comment kind of reminds me of actually something that Putin said. And it's amazing how, how uh, actively you need, if you want to hear what Putin has to say or what Russia has to say, you actually have to put in an effort to, to seek this stuff out. It's not, it's not fed to you like the other stuff. But I remember seeing an interview with him where he said, you know, do you think that Obama really uh, was lying and he didn't actually want to close Guantanamo Bay when he said that? He said, no, he really wanted to close it. And he really thought he would have the power to close that, uh, to close that up. 
But the problem is, is when he actually became president, some people in suits come to, come in and sit him down and say, well, no, uh, this is how it's going to be. <laughs> and there's probably a lot of truth to that um, in terms of, uh, I mean, these people are just puppets. And there's a, there's a certain momentum, particularly with U.S. foreign policy, that just doesn't change from party to party or from president to president. Yeah, and, and I just want to point out another thing. As as the U.S. was overthrowing the elected government of Ukraine, for, for all of its faults, it was overthrown by a U.S.-sponsored coup using, using Nazi militant groups and their associated political parties. Uh, they were also doing the same thing in all of the other countries along Russia's periphery, and they do the exact same thing to China all along its periphery. I mean, that's the primary thing that I, I began focusing on was U.S. interference in, say, places like Southeast Asia. Uh, remember Georgia in 2003, the U.S. overthrew the government there. They poured in weapons and NATO training in Georgia. And then by 2008, Georgian forces attacked Russian forces. That, that was the conclusion of an EU investigation. They said Georgia initiated those hostilities. And then the U.S. did the exact same thing from 2014 onward in Ukraine. And that, that wasn't the first time the U.S. interfered in Ukraine. There was a, an attempted coup in, in the, a very similar manner conducted in 2004. And all of this is in the New York Times and other, other Western mainstream media publications. They admit that the U.S. government was behind all of these movements. So uh, it's a, it, it is a, a very concerted effort all along Russia's periphery. It's not just in Ukraine. And they do the exact same thing in all of these countries. And yes, they, they have, since the end of World War II, cultivated these extremist groups, and they use them just like in the Middle East as a different brand of extremism. Uh, all along China's periphery, they find different extremist groups in each, each country. They're completely different in their supposed ideologies, but they're all being sponsored by the US. And the, the effort is to turn it into an anti-China movement to contain China. So it's, it's important for people to zoom out and, and see the very big picture. It definitely is not just Ukraine. It's the, it is the main, the main conflict at the moment, but it's part of a much wider effort and it includes Russia and China. Yeah, I mean, and it, it's like, what do you do when this organization, you know, when NATO and this and the country that it's essentially headed by, uh, has a history of overthrowing governments around the world and destroying countries, like I said before. And now it's happening right across your border. I mean, what else can you do at that point? If 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 Russia and China got together and started building, you know, missile silos in, in Mexico, it, there absolutely would be a reaction. And here's the thing, too, that people can't get also. When you say, I understand why the U.S. reacted to that, it doesn't necessarily mean you support that reaction. So there's a lot of people who are nuanced, who are in the middle, who says, you know what? I understand why this is happening. I understand why Russia did this. And they're like, oh, you're a Putin apologist, you're this. No, that, that that's not necessarily true. It's you understand that there's a context to it because you know damn well that this would absolutely happen if it happened in Mexico because US, the U.S. is going not only in bordering regions to overthrow governments or to intervene when it when it feels its security interests are affected. They're doing it in Africa. They're doing it in Asia. They're doing it in South America. They're doing it way away from their border. So what do you think is going to happen when it happens right on their border? I mean, we have the Cuba example <laughs> to have a little bit of a preview of what happens. They're still suffering under sanctions today for how many years? Um, you know, it, it's it, it's just so obvious. But uh, there's no room. There's no room for anybody to exist in the middle, which I think forces people to these polar opposite sides also. It's either you're with Russia or you're with the West. There's no space for anybody to exist in the middle that says, I understand the context for this. Well, no, automatically that makes you an apologist for Putin. Yeah, that's a very good point. I remember when, when China was making deals with the Solomon Islands, thousands and thousands of miles from U.S. shores, and and U.S. government was still uh, flipping out over that and saying, no, you can't do that. And why can't they do that? It's nowhere near the United States. But they're they're just upset about the idea of anyone doing anything even superficially similar to what they're doing, what, what China was doing in the Solomon Islands was, was actually a reaction to U.S. interference in the Solomon Islands that included sponsoring armed violence uh, and mobs that were trying to burn sections of the capital down. So, so the Solomon Islands made a security deal with China because their security deal with uh, Australia was basically the, the fox minding hen house. 
You know, and uh, in the discourse in Australia, they were even talking about saying that they should coup uh, Solomon Islands. They should go in or that the Solomon Islands doesn't know what's best for them. And this is coming from a country that has gone in and brutally oppressed people in East Timor and Timor-Leste and all these places. And they have the nerve to say, no, 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 no. They don't have the right to do this. And I think we should go in and overthrow their government. This is the discourse that was happening around that. And this is somewhere that's, like you said, way off of their borders. And yet these same people who think that something like that, something as ridiculous as that is reasonable, can't even begin to imagine Russia's security concerns when NATO was coming into Ukraine. You know, I'm going to go back to the point here, guys. I, I think it's a little bit more than NATO here. You got to understand that, you know, when... You need men to fight on the front lines in this war, especially Ukraine. They have to believe that they belong to something. Yeah. Just that yeah. flag in Ukraine is not enough. And when you indoctrinate people, and it's quite easy to do, when you have managed to get soldiers from other countries, like the UK, they recently sent down a bunch of you. I mean, it used to be illegal for you to leave the UK and fight a war in, in let's say, the Middle East. You were stripped your passport but they're okay to send these guys down to the ukraine to fight and that's where i'm going on this point here is when you're indoctrinating people and you're making them feel that they are part of this organization or this nazi type of organization that is you know one of the brothers and the front lines this is where it becomes very important because more soldiers are dying and they need kind of some type of symbol to get these people to be part of some uh, of a new movement to get new more soldiers on the front line to fight harder i mean look the russians had prigozhin right and the uh, wagner group now they were called every nasty name under the book right and can we all agree with that from the western media they called them everything but those guys fought fought hard took hits and something just something managed to rally these guys you and i we're all sitting here in our homes and you know we're relaxed and we're in the studio we're all relaxed if, you know i've heard stories when patrick lancaster tells me what life is like out in a field late at night you're alone you need to feel like you belong to something and that is the scary part about this nazi movement and hell all these guys in canada that got up and applauded i mean you can't tell me Zelensky didn't know what was going on there. Of course he did. So saying that it's, you know, a sprinkle of the NAZIs -N -A -N -A and mostly NATO. Brian, I don't know about you, but I would say it, it would take a hell of a lot of encouragement to get some people to go to the front line to fight for Ukraine now. And if they feel like they're part of an organization or this type of organization yeah i mean you know, i mean the problem is is that the people in ukraine if they see what happened in canada for example and they say well what am i a part of the problem is there's enough people in ukraine who said yeah a good that, that's a good guy you know that this is the kind of guy we're on the side of and i think what you said is also true you need to get people rallied up to fight and from russia's perspective what i'm saying is and and i think your view is more optimistic and my view is a little bit more pessimistic i think it's more based on self-interest rather than going in to save people i would like to believe it's to save people and i would like to believe it's to do the right thing but at the end of the day if you're on russia's side if you're trying to convince russian citizens to go in and fight against ukraine and you have to explain to them it's because nato is moving in and this is what happens three steps down the line this is what ends up happening in the future mm -hmm. that's a little bit more hard to contextualize than telling them nazis are killing other russians right now in the ukraine so that, that's why I just think they prop that up uh, a, a little bit more. I, I really uh, think you're they, underscoring it. Uh, I could be. I could be. But I just think logically that's what, may, that's what makes sense for me is that there is a very obvious security issue and it's very obvious what happens next or the risk of what happens next. But that's really hard to empathize with. And that's really hard to get people to rally around these you know, ifs and these maybes and this risk analysis and to do these calculations and to give the context of what NATO has done in other countries and what the U.S. has done in other, uh, uh, other countries. Here you can say this is what's happening right now and we have to stop it. Maybe part of that is what's driving them. But I just think, again, 
it's being propped up more for I, what is more important to uh, 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 this, Russia's core interests. I, I really like this dialogue because, you know, we're getting somewhere with this topic where the average, you know, the average Canadian Americans, people in the West need to talk about this stuff. In Lithuania, and I bring this up, guys, the reason why I'm bringing Lithuania up is because my wife is Lithuanian. The reason that I, I'm making a point about this Nazi point here is because of, uh, we're going to welcome Cyrus Jansen onto the show. Thank you for joining the pi panel, Cyrus. Thank you very much. Good morning to you in the United States. Uh, just unmute your microphone and we'll get your awesome voice on here. Hey, everybody. So, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. Great to see you. Good to so, see you, everybody. If you're living in Lithuania, you will find that most apartment blocks have pretty much a circular or we'll call it a rectangle barrier with a small entrance point that was made to protect the apartments inside the yards from tanks and Nazis coming in and raiding these homes back in the, the 40s. And that is a symbol of pretty much any old town, they call them old towns, whether it's in Eastern Europe or Central Europe or whatever, that is a symbol of th that that's what point in history came to, to protect these types of people from, you know, even coming into your front door of your home. Is this problem gone? <laughs> I think it's very deep. It's still going. There's a lot of people living in secrecy. There's thousands of them living in my country, apparently. And uh, one of them was welcomed to the House of Commons. So, yeah, I'm, I'm harping on this point here, guys, because... I think we cannot uh, discredit the. This is a deep undertone, and I think this is used to recruit soldiers. I think it's used to potentially. Yeah, I can see Putin's angle saying, you know, we got to get this taken out, but maybe this is unfinished business, guys. Yeah, I mean, uh, you don't. The, the there's nothing that will invalidate that as an issue. That absolutely is an issue. And when you say that, that is something that, that hits you in the heart. It's mm. something you feel for, and you it's something it. you hope that something can be done about. And that's actually exactly my point. Mm -hmm. It's like, it, it, even if in Russia, the main concern is Russia and within Russia's own borders, its own security, uh, this is something that they can put out there uh, because they know everybody's going to care about it. It doesn't mean that they don't care about no, it also, but I just think first and foremost, it's, it's, a, it's a national security issue. I could be wrong, but I'm thinking that, yeah. And, Cyrus. You know, and think about this, the, the you, uh, Russia intervened in Syria and it's not, there's no Nazis that I can tell of in Syria, but it circles around back to the, the central point that the threat that Russia faces is US sponsored uh, containment, being encircled, contained, its allies being utterly destroyed and decimated and the US military presence, its allies creeping ever closer from, from Syria. They had plans to go into Iran. And then once they're in Iran, they're on the doorstep of the, the Caucasus region. Uh, so, so it's centrally Russia's self-preservation. Obviously, the fact that Nazis are verifiably involved in this, that, that adds to the urgency. And it makes it, like, like Daniel's trying to say, it's not as if they don't, in, in Moscow, they're like, well, we, you know, we don't, you know, we, we're quite okay with Nazis, but we'll just say that we're not just to get everyone on board. They, they probably hate Nazis and yeah. they want to get rid of them. But the central, the central factor here is national security, this encirclement uh, by the U.S. involving a multitude of proxies, including Nazis. Also, these extremists that they've cultivated together with the, the Persian Gulf uh, nations, Al Qaeda, ISIS, all of them. And then if you look at into the proxies that the U.S. is using here in Asia, they're all totally different, but it's all part of the same threat that both Russia and China face together. And so this is something they're, they have to react to no matter who the proxies are. The fact that it's, it's Nazis, um, you know, I can't, again, I don't think Daniel is disagreeing with you, Alex. And yeah. I definitely no, no, I know that at all. I just I, wanted to. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, 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 what, hmm. what I can say, maybe to make this more simple, is if it was only a Nazi issue, and it was only that, and I say only, uh, that's yeah. a huge issue. And I'm, I'm agreeing that's with not, you. That's it's not, not what, that's I, not what I mean. But if it was only that, would Russia still have gone in? I'm not sure. I'm not sure they would have gone in with force like this. Um, if it was only a national security issue, 
without the Nazi issue, but NATO was approaching and we know what NATO does. It's not what it says it is. It's not a defensive organization and they feel their national security is impacted. I think it's more likely that they still would have gone in for that if that it, it existed as one single issue rather than the other way around. If it was only um, a domestic Nazi issue in Ukraine by itself. That, that, yeah, but yeah. it's these movements that really destabilize this country. I mean, they, they do. They do. They have that traction. Mm -hmm. They start out small. And Ukraine is classic for this. 2014. Uh, Cyrus, thank you for coming on the program. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, guys. Good to see all the, all the boys here. Thanks How much of the conversation likewise. have you been uh, privy to? Have you been listening in a bit, or I, I, well, I just I just woke up and went to YouTube and saw you guys on the panel. I'm like, man, I need to <laughs> let me send these boys a message. Let me jump in here for a little bit. I got to go in about ten minutes. I got to get the kids ready for school, but I just wanted to jump in. Um, I did um, I did actually have a conversation with Scott Ritter yesterday, which was quite interesting. So I mean, um, you know, he has an extensive knowledge of the history of Ukraine, and you know, we were we were talking about, for example. Um, you know, he had said that really this conflict actually goes back to 1945. You know, it's actually uh, a much, much, you know, very, very, it's very nuanced. I mean, I think what's interesting is, is I always want to provide the perspective of from the United States is the fact that like everybody here, we only hear like no one knows what actually happened in 2014. Right. Like everybody is just like, oh, this is like all of a sudden Putin came out of nowhere. And this just happened like, you know, uh, February 2022, 2022. And so this is kind of this new conflict that has started. There's very few people that understand the nuances involved. And I mean, I think what's what's interesting is I was um, also read a, a new uh, article from Jeffrey Sachs who had said that uh, neutrality for Ukraine, it, you know, could have avoided this war and it remains the key to ending the war, you know, and that essentially, you know, that's uh, that's what he is pushing for is that, you know, is, is essentially that guarantee, right, that, that Ukraine will not join NATO. Uh, I did catch a little bit of that, uh, Daniel. I think you were saying if, for example, um, you know, if somebody had moved into the Western uh, hemisphere there, right? Obviously, Cuba, I mean, that's the, that's the whole Cuban Missile Crisis, right? We don't, we, you know, United States will not allow that. You know, you know, nobody can come into that Western hemisphere and mess with the United States. Monroe uh, Doctrine, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just as simple as that. So, you know, we have to, I mean, same thing. I mean, we, it's just interesting when you hear guys like John Mearsheimer, who, you know, made that famous speech back in 2015, and he just predicted exactly what's happening, right? If, if we continue to push this, it will end in Ukraine getting wrecked. That's, that is what's going to happen. And so, um, I mean, I think all of us are, you, you know, quite understanding of what, you know, the Mearsheimers and the Jeffrey Sachs are saying about this. And I, I, what I'm also wanted to share was I, I'm starting to see a lot of change here in the United States as far as support for Ukraine. And I think all of us feel, you know, bad on what's happened. I mean, there's obviously war is never a good thing. I don't think anybody here is, you know, pro war, like, oh, this is a great thing. Uh, obviously, um, it affects millions of people in Russia, Ukraine, around the world. I mean, we've all been affected by it, by this, because we live in a global economy. But it is, it's very interesting to see, uh, Alex, when we were in our live stream uh, the other day, you know, we had played that 30 second GOP clip, you know, how they're really trying to you know, promote this and, and really trying to sell this. You know, it's like the best thing we can do is keep arming Ukraine. That's the number one thing. But I'm really starting to see a lot of people in the U.S. push back on that. And it's in, in Canada as well. I mean, I, I mean, even like my Instagram, which is nothing political at all. I had all my Canadian friends are like, how did Trudeau just send another six hundred million dollars to Ukraine? Like Canadians are absolutely struggling right now. I mean, it's it's unbelievable how expensive life is in in north america you know the inflation is through the roof and people are you know the middle class citizens are getting squeezed people there's so many youth in canada that are just like what the hell happened to my country like i can't live in my country like i'm born and raised here i can't afford it i i can't afford to live here this is a disaster but yet you know trudeau sending more money over there like take care of your own people first so again it's kind of just these things that i'm observing uh, you know here on the grounds here in north america I was in Canada a month ago. Obviously, I'm living in the U.S., so I'm observing and talking to a lot of people here. The tide is changing, and I think people are really wanting to um, see a, a conclusion. I mean, even from the GOP, uh, this uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, he is he's very much on, you know, like, get, get us the hell out of there. Let's stop funding this and get us to the negotiation tables as soon as possible. Uh, he, he has some extreme views on other points that I don't agree with, but, um, I mean, trying to find a conclusion to this and stop funding a war is certainly one that I think many Americans are now resonating with.
So that's all, you, I just wanted to jump in and say that. Yeah. Do you notice, I'm, I'm curious about your observations on the ground, because what, at least from the online discourse, what I'm seeing is, all right, people are starting to see through the propaganda against Russia and the black and white narrative that, you know, Western governments would like people to believe on this conflict. But despite their ability, ordinary people, their ability to now see through this when it comes to China, they're still on board that China needs to be confronted. And it just seems like, you know, even mice in a laboratory, they understand that when you are shocked a certain number of times from the same point, you stop going there and you stop getting shocked. Now, with Ukraine and with this war with Russia, they've already been shocked. And now they're ready to confront China on Taiwan or whatever it is. So do, do you, it, it, it's almost like the logical thing would be from everybody to take a step back from all of the propaganda they've been consuming, including on China, but that it doesn't happen. It, it seems to be compartmentalized that people are seeing through the Russia issue, but they're still on board with the anti-China rhetoric. Are you, are you, let let yeah. me let me step in because when Cyrus and I started our live streams back again about nine months ago, your stance was very different than what it is now on, on, on the situation. Well, you know, I mean, I think, well, I, I mean, I'll always say that, um, I got my little daughter here. She just woke up. <laughs> Good morning. Hi. Uh, um, so, um, anyways, uh, I mean, you know, and be honest, I mean, I'll be the first to tell you, I'm not an expert on Russia, Ukraine. So I'm, I'm always one where uh, that's why I always want to interview people. And, you know, I mean, like, for example, I mean, I've had Patrick Lancaster on my channel twice and, you know, some people are like, why would you have Patrick Lancaster on? You know, he's, he's too pro Russian. And, and, and I'm just like, well, you know, the guy speaks Russian. He's been on the ground since 2014. I mean, I, I think he's a value. Like, I want to hear all sides. You know, I'm, I'm very much where I'm, I'm, I'm in a point where I'm trying to explore and learn as much as possible. And, and again, I'm very much anti-war. I want to see a conclusion to this. But, you know, there, there is, it's very simple when we look at this kind of double standard we talk about, right? Like the Monroe Doctrine, no one's coming into the Western Hemisphere, but we are just going to ram that NATO right up into to Russia's border. And there's going to be consequences to that. It's just as simple as that. It's it's nothing, you know, I'm pro-Russia, I'm an apologist. It's just, that's the world that we live in. There there are consequences for actions. Uh, as far as, Daniel, your question with the, with the anti-China one, I mean, I think it's an interesting one because I feel that that is just so propagandized in, in far as everything. I mean, the same guy, Vivek Ramaswamy, you know, he's mm. come out yesterday and it's like, well, you know, China manufactured this in a laboratory. They specifically, uh, you know, you know, unveiled this to, you know, unleash global, you know, chaos. You know, we need to hold them accountable. I mean, you have guys like Kyle Bass, who's on mainstream media here. I mean, he's a very toxic person. He specifically said that, you know, China's government has manufactured it so that the virus is actually, it, it, you know, uh, Asians are not susceptible to it. It's specifically designed to wipe out the Caucasian race. And, and so, you know, I mean, this is what, but he's on, he's on MSNBC and CNBC, wow. you know, ma mainstream, you know, here's the expert Kyle Bass coming in and, you know, you know, it's supposed to be a financial show talking about stocks and he goes off the rails talking about how, you know, you know, this is actually a specifically designed virus from the communist government. So there's so many, there's so much propaganda as far as China. But it, I mean, it's as you know, in North America, I mean, we just don't understand anything objective about China. I mean, it's, it's just so fascinating. But I do, I do always want to mention, you know, one of the things I've been back in the US for a year now, one of the positive things is, is that no matter who I talk to on a daily basis, I mean, I tell people all the time, hey, I got a YouTube channel about China. Oh, really? Like, what's that all about? And I've, I've said, come watch my, my videos. And most Americans, when they actually speak to someone face to face, I'm like, yeah, I used to live in China for 10 years. I actually speak Chinese. You know, there's a lot more nuance that you need to understand about China. Every single person, I've never once met a person that has that has not come away with like, oh, wow, thanks, Cyrus. Thanks for like educating me on that. I honestly I have no, no idea about China. So now I know in a guy that actually lived there and you know, um, it, it's it's actually more positive because, you, you know, the interesting thing is always if you ask an American, do you believe, do you trust the U.S. government? Most American, of course not. You know, do you trust in the U.S. media? <laughs> of course not. They lie to us all the time. It's like, oh, okay, so what do you think about China? Well, it's the biggest threat in the world. It's like, okay, do you not see the, <laughs> the, the, the irony here, right? Like you have no trust in the government. You have no trust in the media. But yet when it talks about China, all of a sudden, you know, there, there's a red flag there, right? Like obviously they're not telling you the most objective thing about China. And then it's like, oh, yeah, I guess that makes a lot more sense, you know. So um, that's, Sorry, those are my, my comments. You sent me a really good clip. Uh, I want you to set up this clip for me. Uh, I'm going to play it on the show here. Maybe just set the audience up. It was a great clip. 
Uh, I played it around the office. People were just chuckling. They said, where the hell did you find this? I said, Cyrus found it. And they yeah, said, oh, Jesus. Yeah. Okay, this is great. So this is a 30-second clip that you sent me. Uh, we played on Monday's show yeah. uh, with the Duran. Maybe you can set the audience up what this is all about. Well, again, again, this is this is a specific uh, ad that is now being aired across televisions in the United States. It's funded by the GOP. And again, the message from the GOP right now is the best thing we can do is force regime change. Right. We want to keep arming Ukraine. We want to take out Putin, because if we take out Putin, it weakens China and America can be number one. And, and, and it just it's kind of interesting that like it's like, OK, we're now funding these ads. And it's no different than like when we started pumping out all this propaganda for the vaccines. Uh, I mean, you know, when it's I mean, right now we're coming up to the winter time, and now it's you know, you got Joe Biden. It's like, don't remember, you know, just remember, guys, I'm going to get my COVID vaccine booster. I'm going to get my flu shot. And, you know, I, and, I, and I always like to tell people, like, hey, fun fact, China never required a vaccine ever. OK, <laughs> never, never required a vaccine. And and, uh, you know, that's the I always like to tell that because it's like, you know, people here they're like, man, you lived in Canada. That place is like a communist society. You had to get QR codes. You had to get mandatory vaccines. I'm like, yeah, we did. We couldn't couldn't go to a restaurant, couldn't go to get on a bus, couldn't leave the country, couldn't get on a train, a plane, couldn't go anywhere. And they're just like, man, that's like hardcore communism stuff up in Canada. And I said, yeah, fun fact, never required in China ever. You never <laughs> had to get a vaccine. But again, it is a kind of an interesting thing when you see this. Uh, I mean, you got to hand it to the U.S. I mean, we tell you, we say that propaganda is bad in China. I mean, China has nothing compared to U.S. I mean, we are the masters of propaganda. We have we have patented. We have we have we are just in a total different league. But go ahead and play this clip because it is a red flag to me. Yeah. All right. Here we go, guys. When America arms Ukraine, we get a lot for a little. Putin is an enemy of America. We've used 5% of our defense budget to arm Ukraine, and with it, they've destroyed 50% of Putin's army. We've done all this by sending weapons from storage, not our troops. The more Ukraine weakens Russia, the more it also weakens Russia's closest ally, China. America needs to stand strong against our enemies. That's why Republicans in Congress must continue to support Ukraine. So honest. It's so uh, honest. It's it's, it's <laughs> actually it, it's scary. Um, it's it's disturbing, um, and it's refreshing um, <laughs> because it, it just. I think they. I, I want to just. I, I want Cyrus. To you say want me to play it this. again? No, no, just, it's no, no, real. It's, it's real. No, no. I saw it. I saw it. It's refreshing because I think they realize that a lot of the BS isn't going to work anymore. A lot of the BS about this is the right thing to do. We have to support freedom and democracy in Ukraine. I think they realize that game is up. I think a lot of people are seeing through it. So now they say, you know what? The last thing we can get at people to empathize with us on is that America grew up saying we're number one. And now we can tell them that this is about keeping us number one without any of our own people <laughs> dying. Other people are going to die so that we can remain number one. And they're yeah. hoping that now that the BS isn't working, all right, let's shed all the BS and let's just say we need to do this in order to stay number one. Uh, yeah, that's I mean, why I say, you know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, I mean, I got I to gotta head out in one minute, so I got to get the kids ready for school and stuff. But Thank you for I joining mean, us. I, uh, no, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. Brian, Angelo, um, obviously Daniel, Alex, so good to see you guys again. Um, Angela, I'll jump on your next live stream, buddy. Sorry, I missed the last one. Uh, but but uh, I mean, I, I, th this is very similar. So I'm in Las Vegas. We have Nellis Air Force Base here, very huge military presence here in Vegas. And I've talked to a lot of people in the in the military here. And I always talk to them about Ukraine. And th this is the message that I get. It's just like, hey, this is best case scenario for US. Like we're spending so little on our military budget. We got no troop. We got no boots on the ground. We got no troops. Like we're not risking any US lives. Like and and we're and we are directly gonna we're gonna get rid of Putin. It's like this is this is they flat out will tell you this is the best case scenario for the U.S. And I'm just like and my my own my first question is always, but what about Ukraine? Like Ukraine's getting wrecked. Like that country has no chance at ever existing. I mean it's 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 I mean even stop today, it's gonna take them 40 years to rebuild to anything you know normal. And and it's just like, eh, you know, like what can we do? You know, it's the it's, same it's, guy. Uh, I yeah, the same guy in that video said Ukraine will fight for the last man. Uh, you know, this is what he said before. Um, so, what is it, a couple years ago? I mean, it's 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 a very interesting one. But I mean, even in that ad, you know, I mean, uh, Scott Ritter yesterday was funny. He's like, I'm just a marine. I just do simple math. But if our budget is eighty, eight hundred billion dollars is our military budget, and we've spent. Um, 
you know, 5% of the budget, well, that would be $40 billion. Okay, well, we already know that we've sent over 150 billion. So right, right off the top, that number's wrong. <laughs> so like, there's your simple marine math. Uh, that's a complete lie. You know, we've spent more than the 5% of the budget and we keep sending more and more money. So um, anyways, I got I to gotta dash. Thanks guys for letting me join in and share that. I'll let you guys get back to the stream and uh, we'll talk to you later. Cool. <laughs> All right. Good seeing you. All right, guys. Take care. Brian, I mean, I, I've been 50, waiting for 50 you to comment. 50 per, yeah, 50% of Russian military capability. And uh, the New York Times itself just came out with an article saying Russian military production is higher than ever. Sanctions didn't work. Obviously, uh, Ukraine as part of this proxy war is not eliminated anywhere close to 50% of Russian military capabilities. Uh, a lot of people are citing this uh, Oryx website, supposed open source intelligence. Uh, and the, all the people following that and citing those numbers, those were the people who were shocked that the Ukrainian spring, summer, fall, going into winter offensive uh, failed. They, they had no idea because they honestly, they were looking at Oryx and all of the people using it as a source. And they were saying, look at these numbers, look at how much equipment Russia has lost. There's no way they have an army left. And then they launched the offensive and they smashed into this steel wall and it broke uh, all of these brigades trained in arms by NATO. And now we, we read articles in the New York Times, in the Washington Post, we, we hear American military and political leaders saying, we can't, we can't sustain this. So that, that's one problem with that ad. The other problem is, pretending that this is some sort of in good investment for the US, even if you are absolutely cynical regarding this, look at what's going on in the world right now since the special military operation began and since the US uh, strong arms Europe into placing sanctions on Russia. What, what has that done to the US and Europe? What has that done to the European economy? They're emptying out their military inventories they, they have now exposed to the world that their military industrial production is nowhere near that of just Russia's, let alone China's, let alone Russia and China's combined. They're also, by, by doing what they did regarding the sanctions against Russia, including the price caps for oil, they have caused all of their supposed allies to begin pivoting away from them toward BRICS. We're, we're watching BRICS expanding as a direct result of this uh, great investment for the U.S. So it, it is a catalyst. And this is something that Alexander McCurris of the Durant says all the time. It is a catalyst uh, spurring on multipolarism at the expense of U.S.-led unipolarism. So a great investment? No, not hmm. not even close in, in every single way it is not. But this is what these people in the U.S. Uh, driving U.S. foreign policy, this is the only this is the only mode that they have. It's just this, this war. They don't even understand the basic fundamentals of how a war is waged. And they're just going to dig their hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And that, that ad is an ad in actuality, an ad to, hey, everyone, get a shovel. Let's, let's see how deep we can dig this hole. Can I, can I jump in? You know, there are a lot of people, they, they mention uh, the, the cost of the war. And, and actually, they stop at the, what we said in terms of... Uh, in terms of weapons, actually, it's it's far more than that. I mean, I, I'm not even. It's not even ten times. It's hundred times. I, I've done a quick quick calculation, and I'm going to compartment compartmentalize uh, uh, this. You know, there's going to be a reconstruction. Reconstruction is going to be one trillion dollar. If Ukraine integrates Europe, it's going to be net recipient of a European fund. It's going to be twenty billion per year. The whole cost of rearming all Europe, because now all Europe is going to go at 2% at, at of their GDP. They, go, they are going to align to NATO standards. Now you have the whole cost of inflation. It's, it's enormous. Now, if you, if you annualize this, uh, I mean, over, over a period of 20 years, the deindustrialization of Europe, because of what we did, because the gas... Energy is going to cost too much, and all those industries are going to leave Europe. If you add up this, the political cost, you know, it's intangible. You cannot measure that. The de-dollarization, we're losing our stage. You know, it's, it's not going to be like before. Uh, 
in, in, in Europe, Europe too, you know, Europe, uh, the euro is going to be also, it's, it's going to lose its status as a global currency. If you add up everything, we are talking about probably $10 trillion over a period of 20 years. This far more than just the weapons we're sending. And then think about the blowback also from Nazis going mainstream, <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. all of the yeah. mass shooters who are, you know, paying tribute to the Azov battalion in their memoir before they go off on a mass shooting spree. Uh, it's the exact same thing when they were overthrowing Gaddafi in Li Libya. They were funding extremists and one of those extremists went back to the UK and was responsible for the Manchester bombing. Well, this is going to be like that on steroids, too. I mean, just from, uh, you know, from that perspective also. And all, all the artillery on the black market. It's going to yeah. be quite oh, easy yeah. to get the... You're going to be seeing some interesting things on the streets in Europe, for sure. And it's quite deadly. It's very scary. I, I have some provoking thoughts for you guys here. You know, this is a quote by, uh, by Carling. He says, when fascist comes to America, it will not be in brown and black shirts. It will, be, it will not be with jack boots. It will be with nice sneakers and smiley shirts. What am I saying here is that uh, it's interesting, you, you know, it's, it, it's easy to point the finger at Nazis and to demonize them and, it, and it's abject, it's disgusting ideology, we all know that. But you know what, we need to be careful at, at the wolf in the, sh in the skin of a sheep. And I think the liberals, in many ways, they scare me, more, they, they scare me as much as the Nazis. Uh, just, just when you look at the, this whole deconstruction of society, this whole project, you know, it's this destruction of family, destruction of nation state, destruction of relu religion, you hypersexualize people, drugs, you, you know, and so on and so on. And there's no sense of belonging. This, this is, you know, as much as it was so extreme on the other side with the Nazis, you know, nationalism, you know, identity and so on, we're going to the other far too far and actually it's a it's a, it's an extremely aggressive minority which is imposing on major on the majority so we need to be really careful because here who's leading us to, towards world war three it's not the nazis it's not the nazis it's people that actually act really cool they say things really nice but they are willing to drop a nuclear bomb on russia if they could you see, we need to be extremely careful. And this alliance, keep in mind that right now, those, those are liberals aligned with Nazis. How toxic is that? We need to be careful about that too. And I think, I think you know, you, you mentioned before that actually the Russia sold the Nazi argument, you know, own, and, and that, but Russia sold also this decadent, so-called decadent society in the West that actually 75% of the world don't want. And we need to respect that. You know, most, you, 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 you go to Asia, you go to Africa, and it's laughable. They, they look at this and they're like, what the F do I want this, you to export this to, to, to my country? I mean, I can imagine, or I, I, I could understand, you know, like uh, trying to export democracy, even though democracy is not working in the West, but trying to, export those values that actually back home we it's dividing and distracting from the the real issues i think uh, distracting so, is the, yeah a good word to use i i think when it comes to uh these kinds of left versus right or liberals versus conservatives kind of stuff i i just see a degradation of society where people are going to two polar opposite extremes on both of those categories um you know, one of the main concerns I have is for how these societies affect other countries. And you're right, they do push their ideologies on other countries. The thing I'm more concerned about is how they go in and destroy and bomb and, you know, uh, d d destroy countries like that. But within Western societies, there is a degradation that's happening. And it's a, a polarization where people are going to two completely extreme opposites. And there are people to blame on both sides of that. And I think it goes back to the point I said that there's very little room to exist in the middle, just like on the Russia uh, argument. Nobody can say, I understand the context behind Russia going into Ukraine. No, automatically you're going to be pushed into a Putin apologist category. There's no room to exist in the middle. I bet you, uh, before Cyrus left, I really wanted to ask him about, because he talked about with Russia, he wants to bring people on with different perspectives. When he brought on Patrick Lancaster, people were blasting him saying, why would you bring someone on like this? 
And uh, I, I can imagine that some close minded people doing that. But also, I would imagine people on the opposite end that completely support Russia, if he brings in somebody who's critical of Russia, would say exactly the same thing and say, why would you bring somebody in who's critical of Russia? This guy just doesn't get it or something like that. Um, so I think it's, yeah, just this polarization and a degradation of Western society. And it is a distraction within those Western societies that's just kind of destroying it. And, and to be fair, I mean, uh, yes, that's true about Western liberals, whatever that even means. But uh, Western conservatives are, just as Daniel said, they're just as bad, yeah. but on the opposite end of the spectrum. They claim that they're standing up for all these values, but look at what they're actually doing. They're not making any serious effort at all whatsoever to actually address this or stand up to it. They have they are knowingly and deliberately doing their part to create these issues as political footballs, to keep people kicking them back and forth. And uh, as you actually said, Angel, distracted from the main issues. So I think I think the problem in the West is that you don't have any genuine values on either side of the spectrum. And as Daniel said, uh, everyone is at an, a, a, I would say, a useless extreme on both ends of the yeah. spectrum. And the they, happiest they, people. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, you finished, no, sorry. Yeah, and, and the middle ground where people could focus, and, and Angela and I talk about this all the time, the middle ground where you could actually get, get together with other people with different ideas and build something constructive, they're just shelling that constantly. They're just putting mines, burying mines there constantly. You're not allowed to go there. If you go there, they're going to wipe you out. You have to pick an extreme on one side or the other. And it's it's absolutely hopeless. I, I wanted to say something else about these uh, people who are saying, we got to stop Ukraine. We need to get them to the negotiation table. Uh, it's, it's, it's mostly because it's Biden's war. If it was a Republican there, they would be totally for it. We, we remember uh, everyone voting for Obama to end the Iraq and Afghan wars. And then as soon as he became president and accelerated them, they were all for it. Because there, there's that aspect taking place. There's also the aspect that, and I, I think people were pointing this out, they want they want to focus on China. This whole thing with Russia in Ukraine is ultimately aimed at China. That is their main, main competitor. This is the biggest threat to their hegemony. They need to confront and contain China. If they could only pick one to focus all of their efforts on, it would be China. So... Uh, we have to be very careful. The people, they're, if they're genuinely opposed to war and a good person saying no to war with Russia through Ukraine, let's stop this. They will also say, and let's invest here in America or here in Europe. Let's stop picking a fight with China as well, because everything that, just as you pointed out, Daniel, people get it that we started this with Russia and Ukraine. And then they're like, let's protect that poor country, Taiwan, which is not even a country. Yeah, they don't even exactly know. <laughs> yeah. CNN but, but, or Fox told them different. Yeah, but I, I think the other thing that you need to be careful about also, because with this kind of talking about what liberals are doing or focusing on what they're doing or what conservatives are doing, and both are doing equally wacky things, the happiest people when you guys are kind of, or the ordinary people are wrapped up in this conversation is in this case these days is the military industrial complex sure. which you know i you know you exactly said all of these weapon stores are going to have to be replenished in europe and all of this stuff so while all of these ridiculous identity politic kind of discussions or whatever it is is going on the military industrial complex is laughing all the way to the bank when you're distracted from more important issues uh, like them taking everybody's money um, and I mean, Eisenhower uh, in his uh, farewell speech said the exact same thing that you that the the biggest risk to democracy is the military industrial complex and their influence is growing in the government. And it doesn't matter if they're liberal, if they're conservative, if they what you know, what pronouns they have or if they don't believe in that or not. All of these politicians on both sides are getting money from the military industrial complex. And when they give money to these politicians to become senators or whatever it is they're expecting a return on that on that investment and they're certainly getting a return on their investment these days i think that is the big big issue that, let me that, let me yeah. hop in on this because since we're talking about profits made uh i think something that we really got to pay attention to here in the next uh i would say 90 days is the financial markets i said on this show a couple of days ago watch natural gas Watch it, watch it, watch it. It's moving down 2.41% today. If that goes over, uh, let's say the quote for natural gas is 2.72. 
uh, relatively not bad, but the futures in the natural gas sector are going through a massive change here. And what I mean by that is there's a shift going on in the market here, and I'm going to bring it up here. And this is what I've done for 20 years. I've traded derivatives. The OTC shares of EU gas derivatives surge 25%. What's that mean to the average household? Look out. If uh, natural gas, keep an eye on it, everybody. Just uh, Google it. If uh, you can't find it, just natural gas spot price. You'll see something like 2.72 or something like that after the show. Once that thing starts peaking over 3 or $4, look out. Look out for the prices and then look out for collapsing of certain types of banks that have bet against this, okay? This is for all the marbles here. Now, we have to remember... Most Americans have mortgages. Most Americans have car payments. They have Visa, MasterCard payments. They're in debt. The Eastern Bloc, or I would say that most of the Russians, I'm not sure if everybody understands this, but when the fall of the Soviet Union, most of their properties were given to them for pretty much nothing. So you have a very uh, small part of these regions. The Baltics also managed to, uh, you know, prosper uh, after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed. But most of the homes in Russia are owned by people. Uh, I think it's 6 or 7% of the population has mortgages, which is the flip, almost the opposite side of what it is in America. So heavily financed uh, through the roof. Natural gas is going to go up through the roof here. I, I am predicting, and um, don't quote me on it, this is not a solicitation to buy or sell a security, but I'm going to tell you right now, Natural gas is going to really set the barometer to what's going to happen here in the next three or four months with this war. Putin has isolated himself. Where did they do it? Well, have a look at this uh, headline. Gazprom delivers its first LNG cargo to China via the Arctic. A new route for China and a new buyer is China. Okay, let's have a look at also how the pipelines flow. Well, they're always flowing outwards from Russia. And there's always a saying here, just because the Soviet Union is no longer there, on the surface, things might all look different and pretty in other countries that were post-Soviet. But under the ground, all of those pipes are coming from major oil factories, ma major national gas and major refineries from Russia. Sure, they took out the big boy uh, with the uh, big line there a few months ago, but I'm telling you guys, you need to pay attention here on the natural gas market here. If it gets anywhere from 3 to $4, you are seeing a skyrocketing in amount, uh, amount of energy bills going up for people in people's homes. And look, what is Europe's alternative? I mean, Brian and I have spoken about this. Angela and I have spoken about this. What's Europe's alternative? Expensive stuff bought from America, shipped over on big container boats, and that is the solution. And if we get into a cold spring, I thought it would good. I thought it was going to happen last year. Uh, let me show you guys the price of this, and uh, I'm making a big deal about this because it's going to be a big deal. Have a look at what it was last year. We saw it peak out at around almost nine. Okay, uh, this is a natural gas quote from Henry Hub. Uh, this was, uh, I think, quoted on the 24th of September. You see, it's flatlined there, where everything's nice and calm. Well, that's the Americans, you know, dumping their expensive stuff on Europe. But let's put two and two together here. Here's where the things change is where the OTC shares of the EU gas derivatives change. That is a derivative. When you hear that word derivative, it means insurance policies. Well, those insurance policies are trying to protect Europeans from price uh, increases. It won't happen. You guys ever remember when oil went to negative? Remember that day? Anybody on that panel remember this? It was when a storage oil? cost. It was a storage cost, right? Right. Basically, basically it was it was uh, yeah. Well, it got it got like <laughs> minus because uh, the that it was basically the storage cost. It was better just you you could not dispose of your oil and exactly. and that minus was the storage cost. So now we're seeing the absolute opposite here happen now with you know the energy sector. Putin knows this. Clearly, they know it. These guys are big, big, big derivative traders. There are massive, uh, you know, derivative trading houses in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. Moscow's got that financial, uh, beautiful. I don't know if you guys ever seen all those beautiful buildings in Moscow. There, the financial center. Those are big oil boys. Those are this. These are but, big, big guys that are going to be trading in this market. 
but but Putin has actually a, a, a PhD in this. What, yeah. what people tend to forget is that Putin is, is the expert, probably one of the 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 top hundred experts in the world. So he's been planning, you know, he, he knew what he was getting into, actually. I, I'm pretty much sure that, uh, you know, when, when before the, the special military operation started, they actually, they planted everything, all the protections, be self-sufficient, uh, finding ways to bypass SWIFT. And also they, they did simulation on what, what would, would the market uh, be the, the, what would be the, the reaction of the market. I think it's coming. I think people aren't aware of it. They just think that everything is sorted and taken care of. But now we're getting into the colder months. Uh, I mean, Brian, did you see much on the, uh, you know, advancements here with the uh, Ukraine counteroffensive, or is it? Are we? Are they out of time? Well, yeah. I mean, it it was doomed before it even began, uh, and now we're actually seeing many across the West coming to this realization. Even people who I think genuinely believed. That would be more successful. But but before we get into that, I want to go back to your point, Alex, that you're just making about how how isolated Russia has become and how in reality that that is not true. Do you remember in the video intro that, that you just played, yes. Alex, at the very beginning of the stream, there was some lady talking about, uh, yeah, Putin's going to go to China and whoever else he can find in bricks. I mean, it's like half the world's population. <laughs> I mean, what are they what are they talking about? And then she said. <laughs> Chinese people coming up through the cracks uh, in the floor. It's like we, this is like yeah. World War II propaganda, where they they tr turn their 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 opponents into insects. Stuff, yeah. Insects, yes, like a cockroach. It was a disgusting comment. Like I yeah. looked at Daniel when that comment yeah. came on the screen. I was like, they're talking about people like they're cockroaches. Human beings. Yeah, yeah, that was the human beings. Exactly what they meant. Four billion people. Yeah. Yeah. So this is, I think, this is an on you know, fundamentally. We could get we could get deeper into what's going on on the battlefield in Ukraine, but fundamentally, this is an unsustainable mindset that these people in the West have that is driving their foreign policy. Because ultimately, it's this idea that they are superior and everyone else is subhuman. The Slavs are subhuman, the Asians are subhuman, and it's our right to dictate to them, even in their own territory, which is actually our territory, uh, what they can and cannot do and how they're going to manage their affairs. This mindset is unsustainable. This is how the West uh, did its foreign policy for generations, but the, the time for that has come and gone, and we are in a, a new world where this is no longer acceptable. It will not be, a, people in China are not going to accept this. I mean, I, you know, you, you're you all in China or, or you live in China. I don't think Angela is currently in China, but uh, are the people there going to accept this, this this world order that the U.S. wants to persist, where they decide everything for everyone else, even when China alone has a, has a bigger population than the G7 combined, will have a larger economy than the U.S. and, and already does by by certain metrics. Yeah, I mean, when the when the you know what hits the fan, they they won't accept it. But you know, what's interesting is. Um, even though you, you you can pick out anomalies and you can pick out extremists in any country, generally speaking, the population uh, doesn't have this, uh, not only not a hate for the other side, but not even an awareness of how much hate is being directed towards China. You know, I remember when Ch uh, some Chinese people found out for the first time how antagonizing Australia was towards China. They're like, what? We, we love Australia. We thought we, we had yeah. a good friendship. Like they've got no idea yeah. what, what, what's going on with this stuff. And um, they, they aren't, it, it, like we said earlier in this thing, you, you know, you would expect the Chinese people to be the most propagandized people in the world, but they've got nothing, nothing. on the propaganda that's going overseas and nothing going on overseas. And to, to have this where it is acceptable to compare Chinese people to insects and to dehumanize your enemy like this or your perceived enemy, uh, we, you know, not too long ago, we would understand how wrong that is. Like, as soon as that happened, that person would be canceled or would be whatever. Like, people would just be outright saying, that is wrong. We we are supposed to be the good guys. But as uh, Angelo alluded to before, the propaganda is so good, whether it be through movies or Hollywood or something like that, they could completely turn people around and say, yeah, this is this is what we need to be thinking. And yes, they are subhuman. They are below us and still be able to convince themselves that they're the good guys. I mean, this could legitimately happen with how good propaganda is in the West.
But ju just imagine, just for a second, if the Chinese, he, he, uh, they were the same as uh, uh, emotional as we are in the West. And also, you know, I mean, extreme. Because uh, you, you, you guys live in China. You, you see how Chinese are. They've been, you know, we're bashing the Chinese. We just, I mean, we, we really bad. The way, the way we treat them, you know, like insect and so on. But they, they actually are pretty cool with this. I mean, they, it, it's that kind of compassion. It's like, you know, we have a madman there. And it's like, you know what? It's gonna, at some point, it's going to calm down. And, and and we are lucky they are not emotional. The West, I see the West as being extremely irrational and emotional. And, and you know, that's the game. We, we the, the, the elites want the people to be like this because they, they have a goal and they want to antagonize China. And, and we get that. And luckily, Chinese are not like this. And this, there's the, an understanding of themselves, an understanding of, of the West. And, and I see, you see, I see those two worlds. One and, and we see that in, in the leaders of, of, of both West and, and China. In China, they are like engineers, scientific people, very rational. They might be boring, you know, you know, it's boring. It's just like you know, it's it's but it's one plus one is two, right? It's yeah, what that's having, just look at those leads we have in the West. There's no scientifics there, you know, no engineers. They haven't had a job, and you know, like look at the Congress. Mm. You know, they are lawyers, bankers, and they do acting. It's showmanship. Why? I I, yeah. Sorry, Angela. I um, I just want to get this point uh, off my chest. Here is I have seen a shift here in two years in being in China. Here, um, they are, I think, more proud of their country in the last couple of years. Uh, I would say the youth. This is what I'm getting working around the youth here. They're taking more of an interest. And that could be because the country went through a pandemic and they managed to travel around the country and learn a lot about the country and how interesting it was, you know, domestically, because this country was pretty, uh, pretty isolated. But the interesting point here is if let's have a look at this chart here. Overseas Chinese students flock back home as more Chinese study abroad. A growing number are repatriating back to the country. The interesting point about that is, is why are they coming back? Now, the Western media or, let's say, other content creators would say they're nationalists because they like their country and they're proud of their country. But something is, is something driving bad? brainwashed. Brainwashed, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's interesting that they, they, they have made this something bad. What is wrong with loving one's country? Yeah, what is wrong? I, I, um, and I think the increase in that uh, sense of pride, national pride, um, is predominantly because of the sanctions, actually. is because yeah. you can see that they are trying to be contained. And even the U.S. themselves said that oftentimes their sanctions against other countries backfire because it actually unites the country mm -hmm. that they're targeting. They know that they're being targeted and they know they have to come together. So when Huawei comes out with a new phone and managed to, manages to circumvent, you know, these <laughs> sanctions and still comes out with a phone and they see the U.S. saying, how did they manage to make a phone? Which is the weirdest thing ever. You know, they don't want Huawei to, you know, this technology company to make a phone at all. And I mean, you know, the phone is uh, the, the camera is really great and stuff like that. It, but, you know, it, it's it, it still has a little ways to go. And what I'm saying is, even though, you know, the the uh, the new Huawei phone might not be as good as some of the other phones that are on the market. A lot of people are buying it and they're paying a really a pretty hefty price for it because they're proud of it and they know that the country is going in the right direction, in spite of another country targeting them, in spite of seeing that another country wants to see them fail. Yeah, and the next target, Daniel, is new energy vehicles. They're yeah. going right after yeah. that market. You saw Ursula. She went after that market. The lobbyists in the United States are going after that market. You can see TV commercials. Oh, this EV cars, you know, show, shows the big muscle cars at the at the, the the stoplights. And when the light goes green, the guy in the EV car, they show it. They're, it's it's propaganda. They're gonna they're gonna nail this uh, new energy vehicle market as hard as possible. You see it with the unions in the United States. They're putting pressure on the uh, current government there saying we want higher wages, uh, we want some more support. And in that chunk of money is an anti-China new energy vehicle propaganda budget. 
You better believe it is. And they're going to come after these cars, come after these manufacturers. See, this is the thing. They don't seem to understand. Uh, we've we've done a, a couple of segments here uh, in the office on new energy vehicles in the last couple of months here. And I learned a lot. I thought it was, you know, every man for himself. Let's compete. Let's get the best price for new energy vehicles. No, all these companies are collaborating together all of them they're all they're all getting together they're all meeting they're saying okay yeah uh we have to get a mandate to put charging stations right across the country uh no we want it to be pretty much the same charging conductor so every car can benefit that way okay what about the software well some of it's open source i mean go for it take it improve it do what you want with it. And this helps, A, bring down the price, advance the technology, and then you go across the pond to North America and the big three. No one wants to share anything with no one. And if you're a competitor, well, now you get Ursula standing up there saying, mm, well, this is not very good that a government gets behind a new industry which they're chirping on about that, you know, for whether you're an environmentalist person or whatever way you look at new energy vehicles. But here's, you know, one of the head of the European Union, the EC, saying, hey, no, this is uh, not good for China to invest. It's not, they're, un, they're uncompetitive. They're, they're making their vehicles, you know, uh, we can't compete against them. It's crazy. And this is going to continue on. There's going to be a lot of money spent on this, a lot of money. Yeah, it's not only going to be that. I think any important sector, no matter what it is, if it looks like China is going to lead it, they're going to come after it. You know, the West has always talked about it, capitalism is the ultimate expression of freedom. Let the best product, let, let the best company win, as long as it's uh, one of their companies. <laughs> you know, um, you know, you know, if they when they make TikTok, you know, a, a product that's just blowing all the other social media apps out of the water, they want to find a way to stop it. Huawei, you know, solar panels. You know, she even mentioned solar, solar panels. Solar panels electric vehicles, and it's not going to stop. Whatever China ends up becoming the forefront of, you'll see them come in and try to disrupt that. And actually, what is important to note, it just so happens that so much stuff is happening in China, but even if America, one of America's own allies ended up being the country that was exceeding the U.S. in some sort of a very important uh, sector, you'd see them going after their own allies. There's no true friend to the U.S. either. I mean, with the with the energy company takeover in France with Alstom, uh, you know, when um, a Japanese, uh, I think it was the when the the chip making industry or something of the electronics industry was really taking off, they found a way to kind of basically destroy that and move a lot of it over to Korea to mitigate it and not have the power in this industry centralized in one place. So what I'm saying is, no matter what. Uh, you're going to see this, you know, the the main uh, superpower, uh, at least still currently, going after anybody who excels in a particular industry that's of importance. It just so happens most of it's happening in China right now. And they tack drone technology. Quite interesting, the timing on that, yeah. isn't it, Brian, with the drones? Yeah. Well, also to, to expand on Daniel's point, even within the United States itself, if you are at this you're a newcomer and you're disrupting an industry, say the auto industry or say the aerospace sector, they will come after you. And a lot of people are always talking about how Elon Musk is part of the gang. Well, if you followed SpaceX or Tesla from the very beginning, you will remember all of the ways that different parts of the establishment came after him, tried to completely get rid of SpaceX and completely get rid of Tesla. And uh, he was playing this balancing act to try to, to stay viable and continue moving forward. I mean, it's impossible to start a good company in the U.S. Uh, unless you do somehow compromise and, and work with the establishment. I'm not making an excuse for uh, the, the bad, some of the really bad things that I, I've seen, decisions that he's made. Uh, I'm just saying that that is the reality. You're not going to make an upright corporation in America unless you find a way to play that balancing act. Yep. So even yep. in the US. They yeah. almost took him down. They shorted his stocks big time. Tesla at one time was one of the most shorted stocks in Canadian history, pardon me, in American history. Yeah, They really tried to wreck that guy on the financial markets. I don't know how he managed to get through it. We, we, you know, and with so many people coming after him, the, 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 the best thing for him to do would be to just keep his head down Keep doing what he does, build SpaceX, build these companies, 
but he decided to build a social media app that he's active on all the time and blasting out all of his opinions and all his political ideas. And he's giving way more ammunition to somehow eventually be canceled. He's like, he's a bit bit of an interesting character. Yeah. But he's got a piece uh, on the game uh, playing board now. I mean, he's, he's got X uh, formerly known as Twitter. He's I mean, got that. That is that his is ammunition influence. now. That is influence. So, I mean, that's why Bezos bought all of those newspapers and things like that, too. It's the same thing, industry. Yeah. Uh, but he kind of lets that, you know, he doesn't uh, insert himself as a in, as a personality into those things. I'm sure he's controlling uh, a lot of uh, the, the style of the reporting and things like that. But at least him, him, he, him, him himself, he stays back. But, I mean, Elon is definitely a, a quite an interesting character. Yeah, and at one point they were trying to block... SpaceX from getting any government contract. They were protecting the utterly corrupt and incompetent United Launch Alliance, uh, Lockheed and Boeing's United Launch Alliance, because they they created these rockets that took years and years. They were over budget. They never met, met expectations. They were, uh, it was stagnation. And they the US even had to have Russia sending their US astronauts to the International Space Station for years and years because United Launch Alliance was so corrupt and disinterested in innovation. So then when SpaceX came along, uh, it was obviously the best candidate for all of these projects. United Launch Alliance shouldn't even exist if, if real capitalism existed in the U.S. The, the way they claim it does. Uh, so they tried to get rid of SpaceX. Eventually, they had a compromise because United Launch Alliance literally couldn't do these things that SpaceX came along and started doing. Well, gentlemen, it's been a great conversation tonight. Uh, let's just go around in a little bit of a circle here. Angelo, maybe you can tell us what you're up to. You are very active lately, Angelo. What's going on, man? You've been pumping out a lot of videos, a lot of live streams. You've had a, a president uh, candidate on your show. I mean, Daniel Dumbrell's swinging by the office here. I mean, holy cow. Let's start with you, Angelo. We'll go to Brian, and then we'll end off with Daniel. Maybe some people want to ask him a question, and I don't know if you're going to answer it. So oh, yeah, anyway, yeah. over to you, Angelo. Then we'll go to Brian and back to us. Well, uh, doing some content these days uh, on my, my YouTube channel, so I'm, I'm pretty new on this. Uh, so I had uh, the other day uh, an interview with a candidate, a U.S. presidential candidate, uh, Dr. Shiva, and I'm trying to do every every Sunday. Uh, uh, I call it Chill Out Mon- uh, Sunday. It's a round table. I invite four or five people, and uh, and yes, otherwise you can follow me on uh, on Twitter. Quite active there. And uh, that that's about it. <laughs> okay, thank you for that, Angela. Over to you, Brian. Brian, you're feeling better now. You had you were under yes. the weather a couple of days ago. Good to see you. Yes. Again. Right, yeah, it wasn't. Up. Yeah, it wasn't a big deal, but uh, still, uh, yes, much better. Uh, I'm just doing my my thing. I was trying to move my my live streams to Wednesdays. Uh, then I forgot that I, I always ask people to have me on their show on Wednesday. So uh, on Friday, I'll have Mark Sloboda on to talk about the situation on the ground in Ukraine, a lot of interesting things going on with uh, Russia hitting Ukrainian airfields, finding finding their jets. We'll, we'll talk about why uh, that wasn't possible before and why it's happening now. And we'll get into a whole bunch of other things. And I, I highly doubt we're not going to talk about this, this thing in Canada. Everyone standing up twice, standing ovation twice for a literal World War II Nazi, unbelievable. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let them bury that. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh thank you for joining the show tonight, Brian, and inviting uh your audience in as well. Thank you very much, Angelo. You guys are fantastic. And thank you for Cyrus uh for uh coming into the program. Uh Daniel, what's going on with you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I've saw in the comments here a lot of people recognize me, uh, you know, from my channel when I used to be a little bit more active. I think the most common question is why I'm not making videos anymore. We did shoot a video, a pretty cool video, where we were driving around the car. We were driving to um, a village uh, on the outskirts of Chongqing, just kind of talking about random stuff. Um, I'm trying to edit that and get that uploaded. But uh, to answer that question, um, you know, my channel was really active during the Hong Kong protests. That was something that I really, really wanted to talk about. It was in my face. You know, I'm a Hong Kong ID card holder. My kids were born in Hong Kong. I have a lot of friends in Hong Kong. And I knew that the uh, the disconnect between reality and what Western media was reporting was just so outrageous. And I had the facts that I had to say it. And also I was in a situation where I could say it because my friends in Hong Kong who wanted to speak out against it, uh, they were afraid because the rioters would have come after them if they did that. But I was living in Shenzhen by that point, and so I could do that. 
that I was so motivated to make videos then. That's kind of past. And I think what I mean, there's a variety of reasons why I haven't made videos. I kind of got busy and stuff like that. But also the other thing, too, is before when I saw China rising, the most interesting thing for me, uh, the most exciting thing for me was that there was an alternative. You know, a lot of these countries in the global south, they're subjugated by the U.S. Um, in pretty brutal ways. Um, and China, uh, you know, of course, they're interested in influence. They're interested in resources and things like that. But they have a far more respectful way of engaging countries. Um, and I thought that that represented a new positive move for our world. And I thought that American propaganda could potentially put an end to that. I thought that American propaganda could actually stop China from achieving this. Um, I don't believe that can happen anymore. Mm. I, I think that the, there, there's a certain momentum that they can't stop anymore. I think there's a lot of people that see through these issues already. Um, and I used to care if people in the West were brainwashed against China and they said all of this garbage stuff that wasn't true. I don't really care anymore. <laughs> I'm just kind of like, doesn't matter. You know, China's moving on with a bunch of other countries and they're doing great stuff. They're making all kinds of cool environmental technologies and all kinds of things. If you want to believe that, then fine. Uh, but you know what? I still enjoy having like today. I really, really enjoyed this. So thank you. You know, uh, so thanks for inviting me. And uh, uh, you know, this might uh, inspire me to do a few more videos. So we'll see. A few and maybe a few more drop-ins to live streams uh, yeah, in the last minute, huh? <laughs> uh, when I jump on my motorcycle to come in here, it's actually not far. So yeah, who knows. Well, it's been great. Fantastic, everyone. Well, there you got some answers from Daniel. Some answers, not all the answers, but anyway, it's great. You guys take care. We'll chat soon and we'll see you hopefully in the next couple of weeks here. I'm going to try to again organize Brian and Angelo and maybe this guy will swing by. I don't know. Who knows? But anyway, you guys have yourself a fantastic day and uh, yeah, stay positive. All right. Take care. Bye bye.